There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day! shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand, and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be, there'll be no sorrow there, no more birth sickness, no pain, no more parting over there, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. I thank you, Father for the uh, foresight, the foreknowledge you've given us about the glorious day, Lord, and we'll walk with you. You'll take us through that promised land, Lord, the heavenly Jerusalem. Thing we can only think about and read about in your scriptures, Lord, but what a beautiful and wonderful day that will be. We thank you, God, for the house of God. We thank you, God, for your people gathering together. We pray, God, that uh, you will increase those that are seeking after you with faith, Lord, that fear wouldn't overcome them. Continue to bless us, Lord. Continue to encourage us as a church, and we'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in your Bibles to Revelation 11. Revelation 11. We'll begin by reading the whole chapter of Revelation chapter 11. And there is given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves." And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. 
In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. So we've left off from Revelation by my notes. Uh, the last time was Revelation 10, and that was February 9th that I preached on it, obviously caring for some other things in the meantime, and I think it was needful. We finished up the prayer uh, discussion, and, uh, and there was another, a few other topics that came up, and, and I, I just found them to be encouraging messages. But getting back to Revelation chapter 11, I'll give a little bit of a review. We've just wrapped up the wrath of God portion. We're getting there anyways. We're in the midst of it. If you read in Revelation chapter 9, you find that first woe that came with the fifth angel sounding has passed halfway through Revelation 9. Now this was the locusts from the pit that were tormenting men to the point where men desired that they could die but death flee from them. These locusts were stinging and, and attacking and for five months striking men in those days as men sought death, but it could not be found. After that, the sixth angel sounded, and we saw 200,000, 000, so 200 million man army, beast army, creature army, what have you, that was going about and killing. They were given power over the third part of men to destroy men with fires and with smoke and with brimstone. And one third fell in those times. And this was just the first part of the second woe being mentioned here. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and the smoke and brimstone with which issued out of their mouth. And yet for all of this, the Bible records in verse 20 of Revelation 9, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, and nor of their thefts. And so we see that men, for all these things coming upon them, God turning his anger upon them, they yet repented not. Neither gave him glory for such things. In chapter 10, it begins to talk about uh, something that's seen where a mighty angel comes down and he, he demonstrates um, the, the changing of things by placing one foot upon the land and one foot upon the sea. And we went into all those things. But of purpose and, and note here is that he says specifically that there should be time no longer there in Revelation 6. So there's, there's a finality to what's about to happen here. There is time no longer. There is no more days left. There is nothing left to happen. There is, there is a, 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 a finality about to take place. And yet it still leaves it open when he says at the end in verse 11, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And so then the finality comes with preaching again before these peoples, the same ones that would not repent. Now if we turn over and we look at Revelation chapter 11, we begin with verse 1 and it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So this measuring rod is given unto John and he uses it for the purpose of measuring the temple, the altar, and them that worship therein. Okay, so we do have another reference where 
a reed is given unto a man to, to measure a temple. You can go and look in Ezekiel chapter 40 in your own time. And it goes right through Ezekiel chapter 42. Here Ezekiel, at a time that was before Jerubbabel, before Ezra, before Nehemiah, before the great returns to Jerusalem came out of Babylon when kings started to give favor unto these leaders to go and to perform a great work there. Long before this, Ezekiel was given a measuring rod to go and measure this temple. This, this temple that for all matters, for all purposes, wasn't even built yet. So I see that Ezekiel was given insight years before the men went to do that great work to measure the temple, to, to, to show it in the scriptures there. And in the same vein here, I believe John is given the opportunity to measure a temple that does not yet exist. Okay, So this temple is referred to as the temple of God. Okay, So I don't believe that this is the temple that's... That's, uh, that's sitting over there in, in Israel right now. That's not the temple of God. That's the temple of Moloch. That's the temple of Baal. That's the temple of the world. Good riddance, yeah. right? But the temple of God here is what's being measured. And actually, if you just take a peek over in verse 19 in chapter 11, it says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. And so this is definitely, I believe, a, a heavenly revelation of, of the temple that is to come one day. And yet it still gives opportunity for the fact that this temple will be upon earth. Because it says in verse 2, The court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. So, so don't measure that, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I believe that this is reference to not the holy city as we would think. We put that in quotes. But if you look down in verse 8, it talks about the place which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, unless God comes in and he gives this thing a, a clean wipe and, and, and makes it holy again before this thing drops, uh, then, then we might as well just put that holy in quotations because it's not a holy place likened unto Egypt, likened unto Sodom, likened unto the destruction of our Lord and Savior. So if you continue down... In verse 2, it talks about the Gentiles then trampling this portion, the courtyard, underfoot for three and a half years. And that's 40 and two months by calculation, okay? And then he gives this opportunity, or this, this insight. In verse 3, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. And so here are the famous two witnesses. They're given opportunity then to prophesy for a thousand two hundred and three score days, which by calculation is about 3.45 of our years. Their ministry is clear. They're going to go out and they're going to proclaim by prophecy the truths of the scriptures. So as always is the case, we see these two witnesses and then everyone wants to know who they are. Who are these two witnesses? Read down into verse 4 and we can start to get a little bit of a description of them. It says, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of this earth. And it's interesting because if you put two and two together, that's four. But I think he's also just giving a duality. There's two witnesses. These are likened unto two candlesticks. These are likened unto two olive trees. Now, if you could, you could look into Romans chapter 11... In verse 11, Romans 11 and verse 11, keep your finger in Revelation 11 as always. And in Romans chapter 11, in verse 11, now I've got to find this thing, Romans 11. We find reference to, or what we might think is, the olive tree and the comparison is made. So in Romans chapter 11 and verse 11... The Bible reads, Then said, or I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more the fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. 
If by any means I pro may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting of away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So as far as Israel was concerned, and this wasn't a surprise to God, he didn't make a plan B at the cross, Israel was brought in to be a light to the Gentiles. They, they gave up that opportunity and rather were just always pushing away the Gentiles and, and hating on the Gentiles and staying separate from the Gentiles. And so God, in his foreknowledge, saw it fit that the diminishing of his people Israel would be what brought the Gentiles or the whole world at large into the opportunity for reconciliation. Then he would use the Gentiles then to provoke to jealousy Israel who had rejected God so that they would be drawn back into that same opportunity of being with the Savior. Verse 16 says, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump also is holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. What are you saying here? He's saying that you're in here by faith. Branches were broken off. Place was made so that you could enter in it by faith. So what are you going to boast at them for? It is not of your righteousness. It's not of your good deeds. It's not because God loved you so much that he just felt a need to just give you salvation and give you this great opportunity. While he did do that, he allowed you to enter in by faith. That's your only re response to him. It's not like my works got me there. It's not like because I was so good I got there. I believed. So be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare not thee also. It says, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. And then which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. And the same thing is going to take place when the Gentiles are left, though. And then now there's the opportunity again for... Israel, which we know now to be Bible believers, to be lifted up. And so you'll see that separation take place. But the same opportunity is there where they can be grafted in to the natural olive tree and partake of that same root and the fatness thereof. Okay, so now if that's, that's the olive picture. There's an olive tree that is... God's provision through Jesus Christ for salvation that some fell off of being Israel that he used in the Old Testament for a specific purpose. They reneged on that deal. The Gentiles enter in, were grafted in, but God's going to turn that around and give the same opportunity for those same Jews, Israel rather, according to the flesh, to be provoked to jealousy so that they may, get, they may enter in. They can believe by faith the same way and enter into that same thing. So that's the olive branch. Go back to Revelation in chapter 1, and it's easy to see the candlestick picture and what that would mean. Revelation chapter 1, and verse 12, it says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. Verse 20 says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest, are the seven churches. And so here it's interesting because like he said, we got two witnesses, they're likened unto olive trees, they're likened unto candlesticks, okay? But you never see these mutually exclusive. The candlestick giveth light unto the house, but in the Old Testament you could read in Leviticus 24 about how pure oil olive was beaten in order to provide for the fuel so that that candle could be lit. They're, they're not mutually exclusive, they're rather the, a part of the same um, the same type, the same picture. There's a light that needs to shine. The olive branch refused, but now it's being used in order to light the house, in order to light the hill, in order to light the world with that same candlestick. And so here we have Israel, 
according to the flesh, and that nation that was used. We have candlestick, which it likens unto the churches. And so we have, I think, a, a nice complementary representative of the Old and the New Testament here in one picture in these two witnesses. So we can get into specifics. We can talk about whether or not this was Moses and Elijah because, because they were the ones that stood with Christ at the transfiguration. We can say that it's Elijah and Enoch because those are two that, that never died in the Old Testament. It's appointed to what men wants to die. And after this, the judgment. And so they have to come back and die. Perhaps we could say that. Um, go back to Revelation chapter 11. I found an interesting thing um, that just kind of, you know, didn't change my thinking, but definitely left something open where at the end of chapter 10 is not John given this command. Verse 11, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So then John is given an opportunity and a, and a command that he is now going to prophesy before many. Okay, that could be the book of Revelation that he now, you know, penned on the, on the Isle of Patmos, sure. But we'll see maybe when, when it plays out. Perhaps he is one of these specific two witnesses. Perhaps it's none of these guys even mentioned. It's just some, some lowly servant of God that was just struggling out in, in, in the middle of Africa or, or some lowly type in, in the Old Testament that was trying to be the light to the Gentiles when the Pharisees were ruling. We don't know. I, I don't think we have enough in, internal, again, at least in the book of Revelation, evidence to just nail it down and say, yeah, this is Moses and Elijah, or this is Moses and Enoch, or this is whoever. But again, like I said, by type and by example, we do have a, the, the picture where the two witnesses are essentially going to bring this, you know. <laughs> they're going to bring the book. They're going to bring the, the olive branch, and they're going to bring the candlesticks. They're going to bring revelation from the Old and the New Testament as a package. One reason why some would say, and if you go to uh, Revelation 11, I'll just read verse 5 and 6. And it says, If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. And I love how God escalates it. <laughs> if any man hurt them, fire comes out. If they hurt them, God's going to kill them in that manner. <laughs> he, he, he lifts it up a little bit. So, so what? If they're hurt by getting smacked in the cheek, they've got to be killed by being smacked in the cheek? <laughs> Right? He escalated it, did he not? That's, that's the goodness and severity of God that we saw. The, the goodness on his people, the severity on those that believe not. Verse 6 says, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So just as they feel necessary, just as they desire, plagues can come and blood can come. And so this is why, if you look at Moses and Elijah, water being turned to blood was the first miracle that, that Moses came out with after the rod turning into a serpent. He came out by turning the waters into blood in Egypt. So that could be Moses, right? Right, by type. Um, the destruction by fire proceeding out of their mouth. Well, think back to Elijah and the priests of Baal when he, when he prayed unto God to show himself and fire fell, not only consuming the offering, but also consuming those priests. So by type, you could say, okay, well, there's a little bit of an indication that's Moses or Elijah. I'm not going to be dogmatic on this. Uh, and there's a lot of things as we start to unpackage the end of the book of Revelation that until I believe you get the whole picture, it's hard to be dogmatic on certain things. But this is fire-breathing preaching at its finest. They made many enemies almost instantly. And it was due to the words of their mouth. And I believe it was also due to the instant retribution that came upon them, right? If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. And this is only in the span of about three and a half years. And so... When somebody hurt the prophet, it was not long before retribution came. And so men would see it. Maybe men saw, because this was such a massive thing, and, and there was so much focus on it. We see later that the whole world saw these men dead in the streets. Maybe men saw and then saw retribution instantly. You trip the prophet, and he falls flat on his face while he's trying to preach the word. Getting killed in that same manner is witnessed by others. It's, it's just an interesting thing that, that you see um, take place. And, and you can see why there would be many enemies that would come upon them because of this. But nevertheless, they had power to give fire, to shoot fire from their mouth that would devour these same enemies. Okay? And they made enemies fast. Mark it. Continue this way for 1260 days. Okay? 
And, and this was just the way things were for that time, where these prophets were proclaiming and men were coming after them, and then there was instant retribution and even fire coming from their mouths. Now, the timing's not all figured out here. I don't, I don't have the timing all figured out. You can go to Daniel chapter 9 and keep your finger there and see where most pull the timing of these things out. And, and maybe you can enlighten myself in some of these things. And in Daniel chapter 9, you'll begin in verse 24. Daniel chapter 9 and in verse 24. The Bible says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consumption. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. I'm back in Revelation. And see, something like that is where they would take and they would break down history into some sort of chart. I avoided purposely in preaching Revelation, the charts. I avoided the preaching on it. I avoided other men's ideas about these things in order that I could try to have God just speak to me directly on these things. And as far as having the timings all figured out, I'll be honest, I don't have the timings figured out. But that doesn't mean we can't glean from Revelation. It also doesn't mean that as things come to pass, we will go, oh, this is that which was spoken. And that was, that's not a shock to me. That shouldn't be a shock to us if we don't have a foresight of every event before it comes to pass. So we're just checking the timeline as we go. I don't necessarily think that every chart that's out there is correct. I think there's going to be something that stumps one of these guys, and they're going to just go, okay, well, that was a shock. Even in the revelation that we saw when, uh, when um, Peter was talking about uh, back in uh, Joel, he, he, he said, this is that which was spoken. And he talks about the last days, how men are going to be prophesying and speaking in different tongues and all this. He said, this is that. Do you know when he realized that this was that? It wasn't because he had a chart and he got to that event. He was standing there in the pulpit or in the streets or in the highways and hedges saying, this is that which was spoken, realizing it in the moment, right? This is exactly what God said would happen in partial fulfillment. So, so we should hope for the same thing, that maybe sometimes we don't have all these things figured out and lined just so. But... The more we love this book, the more we're in this book, the more God's just going to reveal these things as they come to pass. And so I'm going to continue on there in verse 7. It says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and shall kill them. And so we see then this beast, and you're not going to know who this beast is unless you turn the page over to uh, Revelation 17 now, so a few chapters ahead where it talks specifically with that beast coming out of the bottomless pit. And so there's another indication that we've, we've reached something and then we're going to see something else that gives, um, gives more proof, gives more witness to what we're reading about right now. So this beast, what we have right now, what we can glean is that he makes war against these two prophets, overcomes them, and then kills them. Okay, But I like how this, this, this all, all gets finished. It says there specifically in verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony. <laughs> it's almost like they finished their job and they're like, all right, time to go home. When they shall have finished their testimony, then the beast was given opportunity to finally overcome them. They laid down their lives, as it were, for the Savior, it seems. It seems like he got to a point, okay, my ministry is done, now I can go home. Verse 8, it says, and their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Jerusalem is not the holy land. It's the unholy land. It's full of filth, likened unto Sodom. It's full of the world, likened unto Egypt. It's, it's, the, it's the location of our Lord being betrayed and crucified. 
The blood of the prophets is in that city. And therefore, it's not something that is holy and righteous and we need to go visit it in that vein. Go there and see the history, but understand that that's Sodom you're looking at. That's Egypt you're looking at, right? It's not something we need to be blessing and praying for all the time, unless it's a precatory. Yeah. Verse 9, it says, And they of the people of the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the grave. What hatred, what shame they wanted to portray on these men that were out preaching and proclaiming, giving their testimony, prophesying of things to come, prophesying of things that are, things which shall be hereafter. Preaching the word of God and the world, when they finally destroyed them, the hatred was such that they didn't even want their bodies to be put in the ground. The whole world rejoicing over the fact, we'll see in the next verse, that they are dead. Wanting them to be that laying in an open, in an open state. Shamed. Um, just, just, just complete disrespect for the bodies as they lay there. Verse 10 it says, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell upon the earth. And isn't it wonderful they just decided they're going to have their own little uh, celebration of sending gifts like it was a birthday. They're celebrating the death of these two prophets, rejoicing over them for all the torment that they had caused them. Because now they're dead, now they're laying in the streets, and we'll just leave them there. It's funny, because if they had just listened to the word, they wouldn't have been tormented, perhaps. Because remember, the fire came after, um, out of them at their own will. They, they, as they preached, they could have fire come out of their mouths. Also, the, the hurt was only a retaliation. If, if somebody hurt them, they would in this manner be hurt. But they're talking about how they're tormented by these prophets. But if they just listened to the word, they wouldn't have to be tormented, would they? Uh, but maybe it was, in fact, not the plagues, not the fire. Maybe perhaps to these people who were in such a state as we saw in chapter 9, maybe the torment was hearing the words of God. Amen. That's what caused them to be in such a fit of rage. That's what caused them to, as the Pharisees, stop their ears and run upon Stephen. Right? And, and, and throw him down and stone him to death. The torment of hearing God's word, of hearing the condemnation come upon them, of hearing the judgment come upon them, of hearing that, that they are lost and headed for hell if they do not repent and believe the gospel. The preaching, perhaps, was the torment. And this is why they rejoiced that the preaching had stopped. In fact, that's actually more of a judgment than anything when you don't hear the words of God anymore. Amen. You put those to silence in your life. We've seen that so many times. Pharaoh put the silence, the words of God, and ended up turning reprobate. Uh, the the, the um, Agrippa, I think it was, when he, when, when he said, Almost thou persuadest me to become. Herod, who heard the preaching of John the Baptist and eventually put it to silence. He rejoiced over the preaching, but was not, was not compelled enough to believe the truth, but rather beheaded that guy in prison and put to silence the word of God in his life. And that is the worst condemnation to a man upon earth. When he's been given over to a reprobate mind. He's rejected the word enough. And God says, fine, it's quiet. Even as these prophets, they say they finished their testimony. They wrapped out their gospel presentation, as it were, and said, would you believe? Would you trust Christ? They said, no. And they said, you've been admonished two or three times. You can now kill me. And then, and then they, they, they suffered the beast. They allowed him to destroy them. But they're not destroyed, is it? The party's cut short. Look at verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Isn't that wonderful and frightening at the same time? You're rejoicing over your fallen enemy, your dead enemy. They're sending presents one to another, celebrating their very death, and then just life enters into them. They stand upon their feet, and then it's just, just a nod, huh? You think death had a sting? You think death could overcome me? Death has no sting upon the servants of God. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now that's, that's a triumphant way to leave, eh? The, the, Lord, the Lord has it so that they are destroyed and left as an open shame for three and a half days. Although they were absent from the body and present with the Lord at that time, life enters back into them. They stand on their feet and the Lord says, Come up hither to the great party in heaven 
Well done, thou good and faithful servant. No, no doubt merriment and rejoicing was not like that of the earth when they arrived up there into their final home with the Lord. And yet the world saw it. The enemies beheld them, it said. And I love this. And God responded, not with the come up hither, my servant, but he continued to just press upon the people and let them know that they had messed up. Verse 13, in the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. And I love that because, like I said, they're rejoicing in that city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. They're celebrating the death of these two prophets because they tormented us with the word of God that they kept proclaiming unto us. And so God has it suited that they would stand upon their feet, rise up to be with him. And then immediately he responds with a great earthquake. And while they thought that they had destroyed two of God's servants, he sees it fit that 7,000 of their own men are destroyed in that one great earthquake where a tenth part of the city fell. And no doubt, finally, they give glory to the God of heaven. He spoke, took his people. He thundered with a great earthquake and destroyed a tenth of their city. And they give glory unto God. There's no denying it when he speaks. <clears throat> the second woe, verse 14, is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So we can continue on and see the seventh angel there in verse 15. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We're entering in here into a new phase. There is a new king. Of course, our Lord and his Christ were king of kings, lord of lords, through time eternity, but now here it's being proclaimed in heaven that upon earth the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms of this empire that 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 Satan, that that uh, the politicians, that that all these people think that they're building will be transferred over rightly to the King of Kings. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And you can just tack on and ever and ever and ever and ever. There is no end to his reign. Verse 16. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God in their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God. I love these guys. They're always just ready. They're in their seats waiting for the time when they can fall on their faces again and give praise and worship unto their God. And they say this. We give thee thanks. O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. It's the same thing they were proclaiming way back in Revelation 1 and 2, was, O God, O Lord Almighty, we give thee thanks. You are, you wast, and you are to come. You're forever, God. You're, everything about you is settled and established before we were created and after we are destroyed as a world. You were God and our God. He gives praise. They give praise and glory to his great power and his ultimate reigning over the kings of the earth and over the world at large. Verse 18 says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And so here they are singing of the finalization of everything, the, the accumulation of it all. The seventh angel sounds, the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ. The 420 elders fell at their feet and at, 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 fell to their faces on the ground and worshiped God, claiming him as the Almighty, claiming him as eternal, claiming him as being all-powerful and the rightful ruler of all. We get a little bit of a side, a snippet of the nations. They're angry, understanding that his wrath is come. And now we understand that the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants, the prophets. And when do we see that? When, when we all stand before God and some at the judgment seat of 
Christ and some at the great white throne of judgment and some are given according to their works because they believed on Christ and entered into his kingdom and therefore they'll have wood, hay, and stubble or gold, silver, and precious stones which will be divided up. Some will be burned and suffer loss and some will receive uh, rewards in heaven and the others which will go to a judgment that is already settled and established and final. Well, they'll be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Amen. But the prophets, his servants, the saints, and them that fear his name, both small and great, they are the ones that shall receive of that reward, which is eternal life with him and also whatever else he has to offer us. And those that destroy the earth shall be destroyed even the same way. Now, here it's interesting because you'll have verse 19 and it says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So this seems like the ending. This seems like the accumulation of things, right? We saw the seventh angel, that final angel sounding. No reference of the, the third woe is referenced right before that, and it cometh quickly, immediately after. And yet... Even though we see that the king wins and, and uh, the, the king wins, the, the, the devil loses, the, the great home of the temple of God is open and we see that in heaven, there's kind of some things that you see that are left loose, right? That seventh sounds and where there was great description of all of the other angels, there's just these short few verses that describe what happens. It seems there's a short end to these things. Now... This is, again, what indicates to me that we're about to transition. Okay, we've read back in verse 7 about the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit. And we're going to learn more about him a few chapters next. Okay, we've also seen the comparisons that were made, and as we un unfold this a little bit more, to some of these judgments from God and, and later judgments that seem to be later in the book that actually line them up perfectly. So again, we see accumulation of all things. And yet, it seems to be like there's something missing. And I believe indeed there's something missing because we'll catch those in the rest of the book as we start to unfold this book and start to, start to read it. We can apply back at this point. So we've gotten to what I believe is the, the, first, um, illust the first illustration, the first example of the book of Revelation and these last things which are, shall be, and, and are yet to come hereafter. Now, this book is, again, it's, it's a revealing. It, it shows truths in the clearest form. Now, the Bible says, Blessed are those that read and hear and keep those things, for the time is at hand. And still yet, though, I believe there's a lot of work to do to, to unpackage the, 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 the nuts and bolts of it all. So that's where you kind of get to this point. You have a little bit of an understanding of how things play out. We've already discussed how um, the rapture, what we call the rapture, happens there in Revelation chapter 7. You can't find in what we've seen here and previous a better example than when there's a great multitude in heaven that are, that are immediately with the Lord to the point where John's like, who are these and where did they come from? That's the moment, the twinkling of eye, last trump. Then we see the wrath of God poured out after that. Maybe we don't know all the timings and the details of these things, but I think we did generally have a, a point of that but there's still some work to be done as far as uh, just defining some of these terms maybe I'll be able to get a little bit more insight about the timings of these things as we go along but we've got a good solid ground in these first rows. think of it like Matthew Mark Luke and John okay Matthew and Mark tell basically the same story as Luke and John but they tell it in a little bit different ways with different perspectives with different insights to a different audience it may be with a different purpose perhaps and I think you're going to find the same thing with the revelation of John. Maybe that's what's being referred to in chapter 10 and verse 11 when he says, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Maybe he's just talking about how John's about to reveal more things to the same groups of people that he has just basically concluded revealing things to. That's what I believe and that's what I think. As we, as we read through, again, we're just going to let God lead us through these scriptures and just try to get a good understanding. You've seen lots of things that you can go and study out for yourself, and I encourage everybody to do so. I don't have the cornerstone on every single uh, facet of truth in here. Honestly, I don't think anybody does. I think we can get pretty close, but when it all comes to pass, we're all going to have that moment at some point in our lives where we're like, ah, oh, 
This, this is that which was spoken in Revelation. This is that which was spoken in Acts. This is that which was spoken in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans. We're going to be like, oh, and have these moments where the, the light goes on. But that's why we study it now. So then we can get these things into our heart. God can take the scriptures through his Holy Spirit and enlighten us at the time that we need it most. Amen. Just when we need it most. He's just going to turn that light on and we'll go, oh, I got it. It makes perfect sense. Amen.